I have five or six, which is pretty good for a while. Yeah, that's right, pretty from good. From that standpoint. All right, we want to welcome you to Infotech 2016 here in Omaha, Nebraska, and uh, we are doing a day's worth of interviews. If you uh, if you haven't seen them all yet, head out to SiliconPrairieNews.com/live, and uh, all eight of the interviews that we are doing are out there. Thomas Sanchez is my guest uh, for this half hour, and Thomas, thank you for coming and being yeah, part of what we're doing here. here. Let's learn a little bit about you. Tell us about your company, what you do, where you're from, those kinds of yeah, things. Yeah, definitely. So uh, t today I live in Washington, D.C., and I'm the CEO of Social Driver, which is a digital agency. We specialize in social media strategies and web strategies for um, really forward-thinking companies. We work with companies like Honda, Salesforce.com, Accenture, really large companies and nonprofits to help them kind of connect with their people online. Um, my background is actually, I started my career at Cerner in Kansas oh, yeah. City, yeah, yeah. and I was a software yeah. engineer. You're a local kid, right? You grew up in Missouri? Yes, yeah. I grew up in Northwest Missouri, yeah. so I, mean, I went to school at Northwest Missouri State oh, University, yeah. go Bearcats. We do a lot of recruiting for Gallup out of Northwest Missouri State, get some you great know, tech people out of there. It's a great college, and uh, it's kind of how I got involved in this event, actually. One of the unique things I think about Northwest is that they really try to prepare their students for the job market, and uh, they bring back... Uh, alumni that have went out and done great things in technology or marketing to come back to advise the faculty on how they can improve their academic programs. It's one of the only schools I've ever seen do this. Yeah, they do a nice job. Yeah, they do a sure. really nice job. And, you know, I think that one of the things that really jumps out at me too about Northwest Missouri State University is uh, a lot of the kids that go to school there are actually first in their family to go to college. And uh, they really set up a, a system for success. Uh, uh, where when you go through the college, you not just learn about how to be a good computer programmer or how to be a good technologist, but you learn how to succeed once you get into the job market. Right. And that's why companies like Gallup, Cerner, you know, Principal, that's why these companies you know, come, come there to recruit. They do. They do indeed. We were just there maybe two weeks ago, and I always Fantastic. enjoy my time. My daughter may end up down at Northwest Missouri State. Well, so they have a great football team. They have a great so J school a fan. down there. Yeah, well, do. we'll have to go watch some football <laughs> yeah. when we get down there. What What's the transition to go from Missouri to D.C.? How did that work? Well, I'll tell you. So in 2005, it was a really interesting year. Three big things happened in my life. One was I was at Cerner, and uh, rather than selling from hospital to hospital, uh, we sold to an entire country. We went to wow. England and we sold to the whole national healthcare system. And they asked me to move from their being a software engineer to being one of the technologists to go out there and open that office. Uh, the second thing that happened was uh, was YouTube launched. That was 2005. Wow. Isn't that, that was unbelievable? just 10 years ago. Not, yeah, I mean, and now we're broadcasting live. Here we right? are, on right? Yeah, it's, it's amazing cool. how quickly the world's changed. Yeah. And the third thing that happened to me that year was. Uh, my family, for the first time ever, wasn't able to go up to Northwest Missouri for uh, my for Thanksgiving. My mom had to go out and take care of a sick family member in another part of the country. So it was up to me and my brother and sister to get together to figure out how we we're going to do Thanksgiving. And so uh, it was really crazy because we got on the phone. It was a three-way call. None of us wanted to have Thanksgiving at our house. And they decided to pick my house because I lived in Kansas City. It was the bigger house. And it was right by the plaza so we could go down to the, yeah. the plaza lighting, oh, yeah. you know. Sure. Uh, but the thing was, I didn't know how to cook. And they were <laughs> like, you are going to have to cook the turkey. You're going to have to cook the Thanksgiving dinner. And that's where YouTube comes in. Wow. So I went on YouTube, this brand new thing, and Butterball, uh, you know, the turkey company, oh, yeah. Yeah, had yeah. a YouTube channel. Right. And I went on there and I watched that video about how to cook uh, your Thanksgiving dinner. Yeah. Like, not just once or twice, but maybe like 10 times. <laughs> I made a list. I went to the That's grocery awesome. store. Yeah. I went to, you know, like, I don't know, you know the, uh, Target, got some pots and pans and ended up cooking out the whole meal. It was fine. And I went back to Cerner and I told them I had this amazing thing happen to me. My family had this Thanksgiving thing and I went to YouTube and you know, I said, you know, the way that we train people at Cerner is we go hospital by hospital. We pull people off, doc doctors and nurses, we pull them off the floor and put them into a classroom and we train them. Right. And we go to England, but there's no trainers. We're doing every hospital in the country. There's no way we can pull all of them off. We have to find another way. And why don't we look at what they're doing at YouTube 
and figure out if we can do that at Cerner. Yeah. And by after working on that project for four years, we ended up building the largest online community of doctors and nurses in the world. Right. And it's called UCERN. It's an amazing and platform. You, you can communicate to them, keep them updated in real time, right? We do very something very similar at Gallup. We have thousands of coaches all around the world. Yeah. And how do you talk to these coaches around the world? You create these webcasts. Absolutely. Right? So we go online and create these 45 minute videos for them. And and so is it like that? Are you creating videos when you talk about social yes. and learning? What else are you doing besides just videos? Yeah, you're doing um, video is obviously a really important part, right. but you're right. looking for other ways to you know build thought leadership to uh, allow people to talk. You know, um, I kind of think about it almost like um, you know the way that marketing worked for the last fifty or hundred years is actually the opposite to how people have lived their lives for for thousands and thousands of years. The way that it's um, people think about marketing, I think, is very top down. They think about uh, it almost like Zeus up in the clouds throwing down lightning bolts. We're right. going to think of clever ideas, a clever yeah. jingle, and then we're going to throw those bolts down yeah. at people, and and they're going to they're going to they're going to go along with our program. But the way that marketing works in the 21st century, the way that probably works to Gallup and other uh, forward-thinking, successful organizations, is it's very bottom up. Yes. And uh, what you have to do is you have to find the energy that's always been there. You have to build activation channels to allow people to unleash their energy. Yeah. And then you have to measure it and you have to invest in things that are working and stop doing things that aren't. And I think that's why technology people, computer programmers, IT specialists should really think about going and talking to their brothers and sisters in marketing yeah. because we've learned this in software. We learned that the best software is actually created when it's open source, when it's bottom up. And marketing is still learning that lesson. And there's things that we can apply, whether it's open source or open data or agile uh, project management that can be applied in marketing to increase the performance right. of the people side of our business. Right. Yeah, we, you know, we, in the 50s and 60s, we can, at least in the United States, we consolidated those marketing messages to television. Yeah. And the internet, of course, has blown that out right. from that standpoint. And so now we're back to the village in we the are. sense that we have all these independent groups that are moving. You could go on Facebook, right, and, and yep. see these various groups. We've formed various groups. We have a coaching group at Gallup, 5,000 in it. Yeah. I've got a couple that have a couple hundred in them. And so it's what what drives people crazy about that or what drives the old executives crazy about right. that is they're like, I want one channel to communicate to people about. Right. And, and that's not true anymore, right? I mean, think about, so when you're thinking about social media now, besides Facebook and YouTube, which right. are the are the eight pound eight hundred right. pound gorillas. Who else isn't? Who else is playing in that space? Right well, now? you know, we're seeing huge growth in Instagram. Uh, you know, uh, if you're if you're looking at uh, growth social network, you have to look at Instagram. And it's not just you know teenagers that are yeah, on it. Yeah, it's crazy because everybody's saying that in the podcasting world too. It's like Instagram, and I'm like, seriously? It's growing but, so yeah. fast. And what's interesting is now that Facebook is fully integrating it into its ad strategy, you can go to market and Instagram with a truly cross-functional approach. Uh, you can have organic content. You can repost things that your customers are saying or your employees and get them involved. But you can also elevate the conversation through a little bit of advertising spend and really target people uh, so that they see your message. And wow. it's, way, it's, it's much more powerful, the engine that Facebook has built for advertising than what you can do on, on Twitter, for interesting. instance. Interesting. It's really interesting. Okay. One of the other things I'm seeing out there is, uh, is Snapchat. You know, especially in the younger crowd, it's it's really coming coming up. And you know, we saw a Kansas City company, VML, really shine in this Snapchat world at the Super Bowl. They create they worked with their client Gatorade to come up with a filter at the Super Bowl where you could dump orange Gatorade onto not the coach of the Broncos, but your friend or yourself. Interesting. Isn't that funny? Yeah. You know what this is what we need to do as marketers and we think about these channels, we need to think about how do we not just put our brand out there? How do we not put our, you know, if you're McDonald's, you don't put your sandwich in the selfie. Right. How do you put your customers right. in the selfie? 
And by using those filters, by using little uh, kind of tricks like that, you can actually really encourage uh, your customers take pictures and include yeah. you in their story. It's the whole selfie. To, it's like selfie selfie marketing. It really is. Right? Where we're letting the customer be kind of our brand advocate for us yeah. in some ways. Any dangers to that if we think about, I mean, because companies yeah. like to control that brand. Yeah. You, well, I mean, I think that is the challenge is yeah. how do you how do you stay on message? How do you how do you keep control yeah. of the conversation? You know, this is the same the same thing that we faced when I was at Cerner with electronic medical records. People would say, "Well, aren't computer systems unsecure? Uh, aren't people? What's going to prevent somebody from just walking up to the computer and getting anybody's information?" And I think there's basic things you can do. You know, what I'd always tell doctors and nurses then, well the yellow sticky notes that you're putting on the side of the monitor with patient information is really unsecure, <laughs> right? We can't we can't even yes, audit that. At least with um, social media, what we can do is we can't control what individual people are saying about us, but we can monitor what the conversation is. We can yeah. use sentiment scoring to evaluate day by day or even hour by hour. It might Am I being um, more on goal or am I getting away from my goal? And we can adjust in real time. Right. And you can bring that agile approach to, to bear. You know, the other thing that you can do is um, you, can, you can put out partner toolkits. You can reach out to influencers and ask them to kind of share your message. And this is something that a lot of companies really overlook in their employee base. You know, our company, we're a small company, you know, uh, I don't know how many people work out. You said several hundred people, yeah, right? Yeah, here in Omaha, and we have about about two thousand total. Two thousand total. That's that's a huge voice yeah. for you. And if you think about their neighbors and their kids and their family members that are involved in that network, if you can get your employees on message, then you're going to be, you know, way ahead of the curve when yeah. it comes to your competitors. Do you think because the marketing message gets a little as you involve your customers, it dilutes the message a little bit? Do you think that plays to the advantage of the brand in the sense that if if you have one brand ambassador that goes offline, so to speak, yeah. or goes a little crazy, it's not the impact that it used to be because you have a thousand other ones. Right. Is that true? Gonna, yeah, they're, they're going to step up and they're going to, you know, you see this sometimes with uh, um, airlines, for instance. The airlines like Southwest Airlines that have invested a lot in their community and letting their, their customers be part of that story. Whenever something bad happens, whether there's a big delay or something, you see a lot more forgiveness. Mm -hmm. uh, when you look at other airlines, maybe like American Airlines, who haven't invested that kind of um, uh, the resources, the resources time, in the program, yeah, 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 yeah. you'll see huge spikes in negative around right. them, and you don't see the crowd coming to yeah. their defense as much. There's not yeah. as many um, advocates out there for them, you know. But, but you know, we have to think though, and everything we do is as business leaders, we have to think about customer value. And the question should be asked, are we creating more customer value by controlling the message right. or by allowing customers to tell us the truth about what's actually happening yeah. out there? It's just tough for some CEOs. It's right? absolutely it's tough. The old school to let that brand message go and let the customers do it. So that's a tough sell in a lot of cases. Two other channels, when yeah. you think about Twitter and LinkedIn, I, you know, I used to think LinkedIn was like the worst, like nobody's talking out there. In the last six months, I have seen my traffic on LinkedIn. And I did a little test where I posted a article. I wrote an article and posted on LinkedIn yeah. and got massive engagement, which is crazy. Um, where are we at with Twitter and where are we at with LinkedIn when you think of those platforms? Well, I think Twitter's in a real crisis right now. And, uh, and you know, their latest financials didn't show very much growth year to year. And we see that in their stock price. We see that in some of the shakeup that they have in their executive suite. Uh, there's a lot of spam on Twitter as well. And I think that that is causing marketers to, to, to really evaluate what their Twitter strategy is. Yeah, and yet Southwest Airlines is known for their Twitter feed. Yeah. And you right? know, that's of, how they got that goodwill. One of the best approaches for Twitter is customer service. And being able to what there's we we talk about these five ease of engagement. I'm not going to go into all of them. Yeah. But one of them is ease. Can you ease the customer experience? And that's Twitter can be really good for that. Another way that Twitter can be quite good is for um, reaching out to people who are influencers of the people we want to reach and building those relationships because it is open. You can identify influencers a little easier. You know, let's let's compare that to what's going on at LinkedIn. LinkedIn's rolled out some really amazing innovations over the last year. We see LinkedIn Pulse. We see the ability to almost blog within LinkedIn. Yeah, very much. And so. LinkedIn shifting from really a job hunter 
uh, recruiting platform to truly be the platform for, for uh, professional advancement. Yeah. And it's really remarkable to see what they've done because LinkedIn, we talk about YouTube being 2005. Yeah. LinkedIn's been around. They're the oldest social network out yeah. there. I mean, I think they've been around since the late 90s. So, you know, in terms of age, it's interesting to see that they're one of the most innovative platforms right now yeah. because they are one of the oldest. They're almost reinventing themselves, I well, want to say. I and, so. and I had our coaches ask me all the time, Jim, why not? Why doesn't Gallup have a LinkedIn yeah. site? And I'm like, because there's nobody out there. That Two years ago, that's what I was there saying. Was. All of a sudden, again, I'm starting to rethink the LinkedIn platform. It's like, you know, there's almost, uh, when we talk about brand, there's almost an opportunity to brand on LinkedIn in a, in a yeah. professional, because I don't think there's as much spam on LinkedIn as there is on Twitter. When you talk about spam. well, you know, when we go into um, uh, you know large companies and work with their teams in terms of marketing, we're not just talking about running their their branded marketing channel. You know, their if it's Gallup, we're not just talking about running at Gallup on Twitter. We work with their executive team to also increase uh, the opportunity as them as a thought leader. So there are companies that we go into where we're running or at least advising on the CEO, the CTO, the chief marketing officer's Twitter account. And in around big events, we're helping actually run it. And in the day-to-day, -day, we provide them with training and strategy and content that they might be sharing. So when you think about LinkedIn, uh, you know, think about the opportunity when you're at a conference like this to be able to find other people who are here uh, I think Twitter is like that as well because yeah. it's open. You can you can follow the hashtag and connect with them. And you know to be able to extend the investments that you have in time and money right. and coming to these conferences to be able to build a network that's going to be able to be there for you. Yeah, and I think I've made a mistake. Uh, Jeff, for this conference, you know, we were on YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I posted this thing on Facebook. I just sent a whole bunch of tweets. In right. fact, I, I sent you know you I I hashtag. Right. And, Write all that stuff. I didn't post anything on LinkedIn. So well, I think know. LinkedIn it's an it's important one to do. And you said you know you share on there. Now you're starting yeah. to see engagement because people are spending time on there. Yeah. You know I see other tools rising too. We see um, uh, Blab this year has been really yeah Blab.im for anybody that's not familiar with Blab. We've been as podcasters we've yeah. been using that. At South by Southwest last week we saw a lot of brands and a lot of individual executives sharing information on Blab. Periscope obviously still has a big bump from last year at South by. Um, and, and you know, I was just at Hint, the week before South by Southwest, I was in Las Vegas at HIMSS, which is the Health Information Management Society. It's a huge conference and it, it's very, it's very different from South by. It's, it's conservative, it's healthcare, IT leadership but everyone was on Periscope, everyone was on Blab, they were sharing the sessions, we saw massive engagement on social media. So it's not just a tool for teenagers and 20-somethings. Yeah. We're seeing the C-suite very active on social media because they're trying to understand these business models and they're trying to understand this 21st century relationship with customers. Yeah, well, we're doing. that's what we're doing here, right? Act I mean, think, think about it in the, we've got four or five viewers out there watching us live right Fantastic. now. And then we'll have several hundred watch after the fact uh, for this kind yes. of information. So we could have done it on yeah. Blab. I uh, Blab still has a ways to go before right. I'm ready to trust no, them. No, I think YouTube's great though. Uh, but YouTube has worked great. A couple quick rapid fire yeah. questions as we kind of wrap this up. One, um, what do you think is the most common mistake most companies go to? We mentioned a few, but is there the most common mistake companies go to when they're starting their social plan? Yeah, I think that the most common mistake that they that they do is they give it to the youngest person in the organization. <laughs> this is I know, isn't that funny? This is the biggest strategic opportunity companies right. have in front of them. Yeah. When I went and had breakfast uh, last year with the CEO of Allstate, he talked about how strategic data is to their business. It's not just social media data. They're giving their customers this little thing that you can clip into your car, you know, right. and they can monitor your driving and each adjust the price that you pay for insurance in real time. Right. Companies are looking at social media as a strategic asset yeah. because all the data and those relationships you can build. Why right. would you give that to your intern? Well, and then you take the intern, you put them on national television. This is what you're doing and right. let them let them you would never do that no, you, you know we talk in market this is i know this is rapid fire but i have to yeah. say this no, you're marketing you're they good. teach you this thing paid earned owned shared right and peso is what they call it in the marketing world for us people that have a technology background we look at it as you know the advertising department the communications department owned is your is your IT departments, your websites, your lists yeah. and then shared is the only one they give to the interns right <laughs> yeah, correct. All four of those buckets are equally important, and we all need to be talking and break down those silos. But in the meantime, 
before we break down the silos, we need to have a professional executive in charge of the social media plan. That's that's smart advice. <laughs> that is super smart advice. When we think about virtual reality in marketing, is it coming? Or it is coming. See, and, and where do you see that coming from? Well, you know, one of the biggest things that we're going to see it is, is in the tourism industry. Washington, D.C., where I live now, is one of the biggest tourist cities in the United States. And we're seeing um, the National Mall now. You can do um, virtual reality through um, all the different museums, and you can do virtual reality at the Capitol. And I I think what that's going to do is it's going to open up private places or places you have to travel to to the everyday experience. Um, right now, the cost is quite high, so you know not only as a consumer with you know the goggles or even if you get the kind the Samsung has with the phone, right? But the cost to produce quality content is very high. So we're just seeing experimentation. But you know, I think here over the next three to five years, we're going to see some major things happen in that yeah, space. Yeah, I don't disagree. We talked about Facebook here. Or we talked about YouTube. Yeah. What about Facebook Live? Does that is that going to eat into YouTube's dominance of video? Do you think at all in the future? Yeah, I think it will. I, it's hard for people to imagine how much bigger Facebook is than almost any other thing out there. Yeah, I mean, it's so much bigger than LinkedIn or Twitter or even Instagram or Snapchat. Um, I know Link YouTube has a lot of views, but as a community, YouTube is smaller than, than Facebook. You know, people spend so much time on Facebook that anything they do as business leaders and as marketers and as technologists, we have to pay attention yeah. to it. Yeah, I, so I should have, I guess what I should have said is I should be broadcasting this live on Facebook Live yeah. <laughs> and not YouTube Live. Uh, not yet, maybe next year. Yeah, maybe next year. I mean, one of the, one of the downsides right now to YouTube or I'm sorry, to Facebook, is the search engine optimization isn't there. You know, it kind of shows up for Facebook people, but it doesn't really show up in your other searches right. as well. And YouTube, you know, you can embed it across to all the major well, platforms. Google has rocked the, I mean, it's optimized, so big, so, right? It's, right? It's optimized for SEO. Yeah. So you have to, I always tell people, uh, especially when we're in the podcasting world, you have to be on all platforms. This is not a situation, and I think this goes across right. when you think about social you can't say, hey, I'm just going to be on Facebook or I'm just going to be on Twitter. Right. I think you got to be on them all and you got to figure out a social strategy for all well, of them. Well, I like how you said that you have to be on all platforms because, you know, it's easy to get into the conversation. We've done that a couple times in this conversation to talk about these as channels. But the truth is people are the channel. Right. And if you think about it from the person's perspective as the customer, as the employee that's interacting with the company, it doesn't matter if it's on YouTube or if it's on Facebook, it's on Twitter. The the change that happens to me when I walk away from that experience mm -hmm. is in me. Right. 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 And so you have to think about people as the channel. Exactly. And we can think about these as tools or platforms that we use to reach them. Yeah. In podcasting, we always we try to provide the content in a way, and we will for this video as well in whatever way they want to consume it, whether that's audio only or audio and video or the, yeah. video, the video pieces, they want it in snippets, can we clamor it, can it go, right? right? All these different things that we do with it. And I think marketing a lot of times is the same way. If we, if we try and uh, narrow down to that single channel, we miss yeah. out on where the customer wants to be. And so Absolutely. you've challenged yeah. me with Instagram and Snapchat. <laughs> Get I've, out there. I have been, I've been a resistor of that. I've been like, oh, I don't know. At least do Instagram. So uh, I'll have to figure that out. So All so right. anyways, Thomas, thanks for taking a few minutes. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Fantastic. Thanks for coming by. Hang tight for one second. Right. If you're watching uh, the video live, uh, hang tight. Actually look down below. This video is the next one. We'll get started here in just a few minutes. And we want to say thanks for watching.